Looking forward to hearing the message that um, God has uh, placed on uh, David's heart for us. We're really blessed here at Conestoga to have a multitude of uh, gifted uh, individuals uh, called to serve in um, communicating the word. And so look forward to that. I'll be reading uh, Psalm 22 verses 1 through 22 and invite you to open your scriptures to follow along. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I, I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near, and there's no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions tearing their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. O oh my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. David, would you come? And we recognize, brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord from the heart of another David. And I look forward to this David's sharing with us. Let me pray with you. Thank you, Thank you Lord God, for the reality that uh, you've placed uh, within David's spirit a message to share with us. We ask that it be released fully by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray an openness within us to hear, even into deep places, the word of the Lord. Some years ago, when I was in college, many years ago, <laughs> I gathered with a number of people to listen to a lady who was introduced as Mrs. Leach. You know her as Elizabeth Elliot. And I want to share a little bit in the beginning of what she talked about. She had taken a trip to Wales. And I also want to share a little bit of uh, some comments that she had about her trip to Wales. And I want you to picture right now in your mind's eye 
being high up in the mountains of North Wales. There lived a shepherd named John and his wife Maddie. And as she described this dog, it was a little border collie, a champion breed. It was just bred for sheep, had sheep in his blood. This dog joined the shepherd John as he was on horseback, ran around this, I want you to picture this misty mountain meadow where there was about a hundred different sheep, rams and ewes gathered. And Mac was working it. Mac was behind the sheep one minute and then he'd, he'd listen and Shepherd John up on horse would blow this tiny little metal whistle that only Mac could hear. And Mac would scurry around the back of the sheep and he'd circle around to the left because they were going too far that way and then he'd circle them around to the right and he'd get them going straight again. And Mac would then come up behind a sheep and he'd crouch down real low. And he'd, he'd eye them. He'd keep, his, he'd keep his, his focus on those sheep and then he'd race forward to get those sheep going again in the right direction which is hard for sheep to do. But he would race forward and he'd be nipping at the stubborn sheep until we got him all into this dipping pen. He gathered them all into this dipping pen where he then joined John, the shepherd. And John was at the dipping trough. And one by one, starting with the rams that came up on this dipping trough, and Mac was at one end of the trough, and John would take the, the ram, and he'd take him by the horns, and he'd, he'd submerge him down into this murky antiseptic dip. And then he'd let him go, and Mac would be snipping and snarling at, at their face at the other end as they tried to escape. And, and John would take this, this wooden implement on the rams, and he'd, he'd pick them up, and he'd twirl them around, and he'd submerge him, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, down into that antiseptic dip, and hold them just for a few seconds. I've had some experiences in my life where I too couldn't understand the treatment I was getting from a shepherd I had trusted. And our maker didn't give a hint of an explanation. The shepherd didn't tell the sheep. <laughs> and then they worked the ewes from the far pasture. And they brought the ewes down. And, and Mac would do his thing, snipping and snarling and, and circling around to the left and circling around to the right until he got all those sheep, all the ewes, into that dipping pen. And then, one by one, again, John, who knew the pattern, would work with each ewe. And he'd take the, dip, take the, the U and dip it in the trough, and, and then it would head out, and the next one would come along. And you had to wonder, did the sheep know the pattern? Well, the shepherd said, the sheep didn't understand the pattern. How about Mac? Mac only understood two things. He understood that tiny little metal whistle, and he understood obedience. If only the shepherd could explain, but it was, it was too lofty for them to understand. It was too high for them to attain. And one thing Elizabeth said about the dog was, you know, that dog never stopped wagging his tail. All Mac understood was obedience to the shepherd. Was there questioning? Did the, did the, the little dog stop to try to inspect and approve the master's plan, the shepherd's plan for him? No. Well, how about the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul knew something about suffering, and he never said, I know what God is up to. He said, I know whom I have believed. Well, that brings a question for us then, doesn't it? 
Who is this God that we believe? This God who created what some have numbered as a hundred billion galaxies, each with a couple of billion stars in each, in each galaxy. I think it's a lot more, but someone actually dared to count that, <laughs> as they have over the centuries and millennia. But our God who created all that and flung it into space also created the little tiny sliding shutter on the lizard's eye. And more importantly, he created one that he calls you. And he did that. He calls you by name. He says, he says, fear not, Sonia. He says, I have redeemed you, Larry. He says, come unto me, Ron. And Titus, and Bill, and Brandon, and Sharon. He says, All you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He's the same one who asks us today to do what he wants us to do. The God of creation who has the, the whole world in his hands, who keeps all these worlds out in outer space from colliding into each other. He created His only begotten Son for us. We just had Easter. We just came through that season. Well, we're still coming out of it. We'll be going into the season of Pentecost soon. But that God of creation gave us His only Son, nailed to the cross for us. And Christianity still has but one story. Trust in Him. Jesus died for you. If you can trust that kind of God, what's next? Well, you do what he says. You obey. And doing his will and obeying, well, that means many things to many people. He talks to us all a little bit differently about some things. Many things are the same. But just to bring this up to date, if you hear that alarm clock in the morning, it means you get moving. It means you put your foot on the floor. Whether you're a business person who has to get out the door, who has to uh, foster goodwill with his workers or her workers, who has to lead them to get the task done. Or maybe hitting the floor means you're a parent. And it's not the first time overnight that your feet have hit that floor. You've been up with the baby, or you've been up with a toddler who's been crying and didn't, didn't know why she was crying. Or maybe you're, the older child has gone off to, to, off to school. You're a student. Yes, obedience means what? Hitting the books. Or maybe you're a retiree. You have a little more leisure in your life. But you also have incumbent on you in following God's will that heart of a volunteer. And you're out there, you're working in church, you're working in the community, you're working in the lives that you care about. And it means obedience to that mission. Life's privileges is also, on the other side, filled with a lot of hardships. Not always a rosy path. Mark Lowry uh, had a favorite, a favorite verse he talks about. And it's this, and it came to pass. <laughs> In other words, it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. <laughs> Tax season is now upon us. Well, it came to pass, okay? It'll be over. Flat tires. Well, they, they do come to pass. You might have to fix them, but they come to pass. They didn't come to stay. The flu. Well, it came to pass. You might pass first, but the flu came to pass. Darkness. Now darkness. Darkness turns into daylight. But sometimes not before many things happen. You know what I think that, what I've come to realize that the purpose of darkness is with your big toe to find the furniture in the middle of the night. I actually busted my toe. I broke it on a couch that I'd put up on concrete blocks to reupholster. 
And in that darkness, a blaze of stars lit up the night. Some of those billions I saw in that moment that I still remember today, that Cheryl continues to chuckle over. <laughs> but it came to pass. And Mark Lowry, he also talked about life isn't static. It's, it's really a roller coaster. And if you think that the, 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 it came to pass, you know, if you look in the King James Version, you find that over 400 times, depending which, uh, you know, which, which uh, concordance you're looking at or, or how you're, you're counting them, uh, it came to pass. But the roller coaster with his dips, they came to pass. And isn't it, isn't it amazing that the guy who does the release on the end of the roller coaster, up top, at the very top, before he pulls that lever or pushes the button to let it go, he never says a prayer for you. He never, he never lets go. He never, he, he never says, look out below. He never says any of that. And then you have, the, in life, you have those dips. And you have the high points, and you have the dips, and you have the high point, the dips and the high points, and the dips and the high points. And then you come to Christ. And life changes, because our Lord said, I have come to, he said, I've come to give you life, and to give it to you more abundantly. So now you have those dips, those burdens, and you have those, those high points, and you have those bits, more abundantly, right? Abundant means present with a great amount. And if you look at it in the dictionary, present in great quantity. But now, I have something a little tougher to talk about. Sometimes we, pastors and chaplains and anyone asked to come up here and speak as we're preparing, we have those little chats with the Lord. No, I, I, I can't tell them that. Do I tell them that? Do I really tell them that? Yes, I should share it. It's, it's the right thing to do to straighten out what's misunderstood. But it's going to be so hard. But you need to tell them. Okay, I tell them. So, here it is. It's a saying. It's in our world. It's on bumper stickers. It's embroidered on sweatshirts. It's on plaques. It's on posters. There's a saying, God will never give you more than you can handle. Really? Don't say that. Please don't say that. To the couple, the new parents in the ER, whose baby dies on Christmas Eve. Don't say that. To the teen who just got, who just survived a plane crash but lost his whole family. Don't say that to the spouse who's found out the partner has a terminal illness. Please don't say that to the girl who's, who's just been robbed of her innocence. You won't find that phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle, in Scripture. What you will find is a misused, misunderstood verse. And most who think that that little saying is in there would point to this, uh, this particular verse. It's in, if you want to look at it, it's in 1 Corinthians 10. I'm just going to read it in verse 13. And it's this. This is the one that's often misunderstood. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Did you hear that? It's not about... Well, what it is about is temptation. 
It's about being tempted. In that we have a choice, don't we? It's not about suffering. It's not about life's challenges. It's not about the hardships that you often don't ask to be involved in, but come and are allowed into your life. With temptation, we have a choice, but with suffering, we often don't have a choice. Jesus knew about suffering. We know from the Psalm, from Psalm 22, that Pastor Bob read for us. Paul knew a lot about suffering, too. And I want to share what is kind of his claim to fame as far as understanding his sufferings. It's over in 2 Corinthians 11. In 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 24, what we read there in 24, down through 27, we read, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without any sleep. I have been hunger, hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. This was the mission of his heart. All the churches. And then, just to follow that, uh, back up to chapter 1 in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to spend a little time here. In 2 Corinthians 1, in verse 8, he says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Even of life. He had more than he could handle. He didn't care if he lived if he, or if he died at that time. Look at verse 9. Here's some hope. In verse 9, Indeed, our hearts, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. You catch that? He ran to God, who raises the dead. Maybe your struggle... It's really not over you. Maybe your struggle, maybe you're saying, you know what, I could take some of those hardships that Paul got. I could bob around in the water for a day and a half. I could take some of those beatings. But what I really have struggled with is seeing a child or a spouse or a friend hurting and their struggles. I hurt watching Cheryl suffer with cancer when she had it twice. I wanted to take it and put it on my back for her. And after a long time, I think each time, she just wanted to go home, capital H, to heaven. And God brought her through that twice. And I don't pretend to stand here and know why. She's here today, and I'm thankful. And Tammy, or Roy, or Wimpy, or Barbara, or Doug, and others are not. They're in heaven. Cheryl's cancer could return. The doctors don't say it's in remission. They just kind of visit with her every couple of years, and they say, huh, you're, st you're still here. That's really something. How many years? 10? 17? But 
But listen, I do know this. Such knowledge is not for us to know. Like for the sheep, it's too lofty, it's too high. There's a song written by Andre Crouch called Through It All. And I thought of this as I was preparing and he wrote, for, I'd never, for if I'd never had a problem, I wouldn't know that he could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've, I've learned to trust in God. Let me tell you something. It's better to run towards God for shelter in the storms of life than it is to run away. There you find the comfort. There you find the strength, as I've often found, and many of you have found, I'm sure, many. But sometimes our Lord, and this is a great poster, you see this one, this one is true. Listen loud and clear. Sometimes our Lord calms the storms. Sometimes he lets the storms rage and calms the child, calms his child. Remember, God has it. Whatever you're going through, He's got it. There's a story of just a little girl in a vicious thunderstorm, and the lightning is flashing in one window and then flashing in the other and the drapes are blowing this way and the drapes are blowing that way and the thunder is coming down on the roof and, and as the rain falls you can feel the thunder sh rattling the windows and the, the girl is praying beside her bed on her knees dear God I, I know you love me I, this is hard this is I know I can pray to you any time whether it's morning or night or noon but this, guy, this time, could you just send someone with skin on? <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? Just send somebody with skin on. Why well, we want to take a look back at verse 10 and 11. <laughs> he has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Did you catch that? The prayers of many. So to encourage each of you today, I want you to remember he sent us people with skin on. He sent us Pastor Bob, kind-hearted, a great listener. He has sent us the leadership team in this church. He has sent us the visitation team who will go out to our homes and listen or talk to us on the phone and listen. He has sent us Stillwater's ministry and Sam and Jill who can help untangle some of the knots in life and listen. He has sent, look around, he has sent this body of believers, this fellowship of followers of Christ. So before you leave today, I'd like to ask that you turn to a person around you after the last song, okay? before you leave. And after the benediction. And I'd like you to turn around to that person, just, just one person, and say, I want to pray for one thing that's hard for you right now. It doesn't have to be the hardest thing in your life. If you want to share that, great. Remember also up front, will be Sam and Jill, our leadership couple, standing up front also to pray for you.
but I want you to realize of all the hope that we have in prayer he's given us people with skin on too the trials are tough but through it all he'll help us run to him let's pray my gracious Lord as I think of the many different ways you've given us your blessings you've allowed things to come into our lives that we don't begin to understand we don't know the pattern we don't always hear the little metal whistle to follow your directions either but we need your wisdom Lord we need your words. We need your ways. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to continue to look to you. In your name, amen.